Hey guys, welcome to Poker Stories Behind the Scenes, the podcast around poker and what's happening around it. We've got a special guest today, Herbert, who is uh, also a friend of mine and um, creating this podcast for you guys. And we've got a special format today, uh, 52 questions. Um, 52 questions because we've got 52 cards in the card deck of uh, poker. And uh, the questions are based around poker, life, and so on. So we just get started right away. Herbert, welcome to the podcast. Uh, hi, Vladimir. Welcome again. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to your questions. All right. Uh, we've got um, different categories, and we will start with the mindset. First question. So first question is about the mindset. Do you have a really good mindset or are you a guy of a stop loss limit approach? Um, in theory, I would go for the stop loss limit. Uh, the reason being like later in my career, I, I really had a, a strict stop loss limit, like not even like in, in terms of buy-ins. So I played and once I, I got a bad beat, even like only one bad beat or I played a hand poorly, I just uh, stopped the session. And that really helped my win rate. So I would go for the stop loss limit and work on the mindset uh, on the side uh, behind behind it to keep your stop loss limit going. All right. And uh, the next question is, is a question I just added in the meantime. So what was your stop, uh, stop loss limit actually? And another question would be if you... If you were like, oh, I have a stop limit, but not today, and you ended up losing quite a bit, what was the biggest like downswing, the, the worst session you probably remember that went wrong? Um, so basically, I I aimed at a stop loss limit of around 10 buy-ins, uh, so to say. <laughs> um, but when I had like this high stop loss limit, I, I never actually kept it. So sometimes, yes. But uh, I remember like the worst session in my life. It was late in the evening uh, on the Spanish uh, Poker Stars. <laughs> and uh, one of the best guests joined me in a heads-up table. Uh, he was very laggy and he only played very occasionally. Like he came once a month and donated all his money. Like uh, uh, it was like five, five, ten heads-up, I believe. And I was... I played him like because it, it was a, a treasure like playing against him like he was not that bad but not not good so but then like uh, I ran really poorly and I was down I believe twenty five buy-ins like uh, and I I didn't care about the stop loss limit uh, that's impossible and then I remounted and was up two two buy-ins and then I said <laughs> no maybe I. I should quit now. I got all my money, but then it's, no, I want to play him again. And then I, I dropped again 20 buy-ins and, and then he quit. So uh, that was the, the, the worst and the yeah. most tilting session ever. Yeah, yeah. This is actually really, that's so tilting because you actually, you lost a lot. Then you won it back and then you could have quit. And then the guy quits you. That's terrible. Yeah, yeah. And also what I wanted to add is like you said, uh, why do we not keep the stop loss limit? I think it really has to do uh, with the games going. So you had a time. I actually remember myself that I I would just if I lo if I had a losing day, I would strictly go for winning days. Just win a little bit and quit. Win a little bit and quit to regain confidence. But then when the games got really tough, you just had to play. That's the issue. Like if you were at a table. You got lucky to get to the table. You to get the weak opponent. You had to play. You can't quit. If you quit, there is no game going. And uh, if you are tilting and you can't quit, that's yeah. The, that's really part terrible. of the issue was what you said. Like there were hardly any games going or good games going. So once you have a good game and you say no, fuck the stop loss limit, uh, I just continue playing because I won't get the chance. Maybe like yeah. in the entire month. To have uh, such a prof profitable heads up game, but uh, oh, well, right. in the end, but there are actually stories of of people waiting for Gus Hansen to join <laughs> the table, so they would they would open up full tilt poker tables, turn on the volume, and if someone said there would be a beep, 
And also, the, so you have to post your big blinds that would wake up in, in the night. They were just waiting for, for the player. So, yeah. And it's a very stressful. Anyhow, moving on to the next question. Are you a grinder or, or an artist at the poker table? Um, I, I was always a grinder. I like the, the grinding aspect a lot. Um, part of it being that I always need to get in touch with the match and the table in particular. So, um, like if, if I come in cold at the table, I don't play my best poker, uh, so to say, which is a little bit of weird because usually you have your, your game plan set, but, um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm more the the, the grinding uh, type of style. I always enjoy that, even like in tournaments, like playing, staying up, uh, and grinding the the opponent down because I knew I could focus longer uh, th than my opponent. So yeah, grinder grinder type. Yeah, all right, that sounds great. Uh, next question is: Do you always follow your bankroll management? And we had just realized not always, but maybe you can tell us more details. About uh, it. Not always, uh, almost, almost never. Um, it's it's similar to the stop loss limit. You have your bankroll management going, like you know, like you want whatever hundred uh, buy-ins uh, minimum. But then you 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 spot a good table, uh, you you go with the flow, and that that sometimes backfires. That happens to all of us. Uh, so I went broke uh, several times in my career, uh, uh, but grinded always up. But yeah, in theory, that, that's what happens. And uh, I always wished I could really maintain bankroll management. And throughout my career, like the, the, the more time I spent playing poker, I realized how just how important bankroll management is. And I always like got closer to maintaining my bankroll management uh, at all. So it, it's it's just so fundamental and so easy to understand, but it's so hard to practice and, and put it up uh, really uh, in, in any situation that can occur. I agree on that. You There are many poker players who are pretty much unknown. They just grind. They never even play high stakes and they could play the highest stakes. They just don't want the variance. They have strict rules. Grinding, grinding, keeping it low variance uh, so you have less stress. And like you said, we, we both must have lost a lot of money by not following the rules we made for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, next question is about tilt or meditation. Um, uh, I'm a tilter, uh, as I said, uh, but uh, I did a lot of meditation too, and it helped me balance the stuff. So by nature, I'm I'm a really hardcore tilter. Uh, I can't help it. But uh, I always worked on that aspect uh, to to achieve well quite a success in in, in tilt control. So um, I believe like poker just touches like your your like your your, your wildest nature, your, the animal in you. And in order to be successful, you, you need to to control that part of you it, you can't like remove it that's just impossible but you have to work around uh like your your personal limitations um and and focus really on on your mindset uh to move forward all right i agree on that and given that we know that you are a tilting guy you for sure destroyed something so we want to know what is the total value of stuff you you killed during your tilting <laughs> session and what was the most expensive thing you you occasionally just just uh, threw away i i destroyed countless uh gamer mouse mouses uh, uh so i believe like you know logitech racer the expensive ones i i destroyed minimum more than 10 uh <laughs> several keyboards um i well uh, the, maybe the, I, I broke a table once. Um, like I, I, I hit my table and it split because it was a, a cheap table and it almost destroyed my two new uh, gaming monitors because they like everything came down on me. Uh, I, I managed to save this. But to tell your number, maybe 3,000 euros uh, uh, in stuff. So, yeah. All right. Quite all right. a bit. <laughs> yeah. Next question is, are you a GT GTO player or exploiting opponents? So GTO for game theory optimal. Um, I, I started poker way before GTO really came up. Uh, and um, 
I always enjoy the the uh, exploitive aspect uh, in, in in poker, especially later in my career when I, when I was playing in Spain. There were very few tables going on, and. Um, um, so I tried to exploit my opponents. Uh, I got into the GTO stuff as well, but I never really battled against like all the regs on on my level. So I tried to be very selective in my in my game selection. Uh, so um, I would say um, exploitative approach um, uh, counts for me more. All right. Have you ever self excluded yourself on a gaming platform? Never. Never, I never self excluded. Uh, I got excluded once uh, oh. on the on the Spanish poker poker star side because there there was a huge uh, cheating scandal going on with some players uh, who lived in Valencia. I was friends with them, um, but um, and I always played with them at the tables naturally because they were like. 30% of the players who were playing like uh, my, my stakes and I got ex excluded uh, as one of them got, uh, caught, got caught cheating. They were multi-accounting, all that weird stuff. And it actually took me quite a while to get my account reopened. Um, but I, I never self-excluded in any form. All right, all right. Next question is poker books or poker videos? I'm a, a book guy. Uh, so uh, I read many poker books, but I enjoyed many poker videos uh, as well um i would say both actually both both have like different uh, distinct styles of teaching you something um so uh, i like both in 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 doubt i go for the poker book all right what's your best tilt story um there are many, many best tilt stories, but I'm going to focus on one which was very, maybe enters as well in the most embarrassing moment. So when I worked for Poker Strategy, uh, I believe I was uh, head of education back then already. Uh, and we had like this huge um, online meeting with all the, the German coaches and freelancers and moderators in the forum. There were around 150 people uh, in that meeting. And like my task was just to be there. I had, didn't have to talk uh, about anything. So I thought, okay, like uh, I don't have a role in that meeting. I just need to be there. So I, I opened some tables. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I, I played four tables, I believe, and listened uh, to the podcast. And that, that was recorded as well. So now what happened? Like I, for some reason, I unplugged my, my, my microphone, which was muted. And, and plugged it in again. And for some reason, Windows activated my mic without me knowing. So you know what happens. Like I got a bad bit and really started like hitting stuff, like throwing stuff, like swearing. And everything in the chat, like in, in the meeting chat was like, what, what, what the fuck? Wow. Nice hand. All like there is still a recording of that, but it's under 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 lock and seal. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that that's the, the worst tilt story because it was so embarrassing. All right. Yeah, that sounds sounds like the story of of a of a TV moderator who who's got some some um, interesting sites open <laughs> on the laptop, and the news are starting, and he is trying to close it. There, there were like a couple of them in in on German television, which is uh, yeah, yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, okay, moving on to the next uh, question, and that is. Um, what is your most memorable well, poker hand? So what hand do you remember the most? Um, the, the couple of candidates, but one hand I remember the most, it was uh, when I started playing PLO and I was experimenting with my short stack uh, strategy um, for, for PLO. So I, I played short stack um, and I started 1-2, I believe, PLO 1-2. Uh, and then I doubled up and, and spotted a good table and played 2-4 uh and and doubled up again and and, and then I, I i said okay i take a shot at 510 uh, uh i was short stack then i i tripled and and i wanted to leave but i wanted to wait for the big blind as you do as a short stack or whatever <laughs> like. and then in like really before like uh, i got to the big blind i got double suited kings like not not really good kings uh it was king king whatever like so some random cycles, but double suited. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I three bet uh, and, and 
two players called and I flopped top set on a <laughs> king seven four board and and I believed like okay I, I'm good like uh, uh, it was um, like a flush draw was there and then I got it in against two players. Uh, all, like, and then I said, okay, I have top set. And then like one had like a huge wrap with a flush draw and back to flush draw. And the other guy had uh, like a huge draw as well. And then the, the turn came and made a second flush draw possible. Uh, and okay, I, I was really hard because the pot was really, really big, like for my bankroll. It was uh, half of my bankroll basically uh, at the time and uh, I, I really sweat and uh, I managed to well suck out the draw guys because I, I believe on the turn I just had 25% to win because there was almost no card left that wouldn't like improve one of the guys so yeah I managed to win that and that like um, stick is uh, sticked to my mind a lot like that's one of the most memorable hands uh, in terms of, of sweat um, yeah, 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 yeah. I think most of us remember those hands because that's where a lot of our bankroll is at the table. And uh, if you lose this hand, you never know where you would have went uh, in poker. Yeah, All right. Back to low stakes for sure. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so do you, next question is about your, your setup. Uh, do you have like a really strict setup for playing or do you play on your laptop, iPad, iPhone, uh, or in the train, in a car, in the hotel room, at the toilet, mm -hmm. whatever. Or do you say you have got an office where you're just grinding? Uh, I always was reluctant on my setup. I, I really enjoyed, like I had my, my fixed setup, like even the, the mouse pad, the mouse, like everything had to be in order. And then I, I played my best. I, I played on, on, on laptops too all the time, but I, um, yeah, I, I didn't play my A game on that. Like, uh, I'm, I was really, really um, I needed my, my gaming setup to really focus and, and get in the zone, especially when grinding. All right. Your longest poker session? Uh, yeah, uh, more than one day for sure. It, it was about 36 hours, 37 hours, like close to 40 hours. Yeah, for sure. And I did that several times, not only once. Yeah, yeah. I actually remember my, I had a very long session until the morning, 8 a.m., but not so long as you played. It was the biggest, biggest losing day of my life. <laughs> then I went for a tennis session, training session, and my tennis teacher was like, oh, you are you're a poker player you're so rich you can buy anything and i have to work and i'm like yeah you don't know what happened last <laughs> night but like <laughs> yeah right um next question is best software of all time uh you mean in terms of poker yeah right mm. poker side best so well we can actually go for both yeah best poker site and best poker software uh Best poker site, definitely full tilt. Uh, that was like back in the days, just like, yeah, uncomparable to anything else. Um, and uh, yeah, full tilt uh, by far the best software, um, my experience. Uh, for poker software, I would say um, like the, 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 the tracking software. Uh, I used um, poker track in the beginning and then switched to holder manager. And and kept it, and it was just amazing having all the data, all all that stuff you could do and see, like with the heart on the table. Um, so I, I would say hold a manager. Yeah. All right, and we've got a, actually another question that that just came to my mind. How often did you check your graph in hold a manager during the session and during the day? I. Well, I, I checked several times, but I, I was not like that was not my fetish that I, I needed to check it all the time. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I checked even even during play because sometimes I, I played so many tables and and you lose track of like how it's going. So I, I double checked, um, and I, I hope it didn't influence my my play <laughs> at all. It did for sure. It did for. <laughs> I think that is that's one of the 
biggest leagues people have. I remember a really good player telling me, like, why do you even look at it? You know you are a winning player, so the money is going to come in. But you, you are getting so into I remember checking my graph like every five minutes sometimes because you would get all in three times and then you would lose. And oftentimes you would you just would take a look at the equities and be like, I knew I was ahead, but I lost the head. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, and it's it's not going to help you. One thing that actually Phil Galfond said that uh, was was really interesting that he had like said, like, if you take a look at it and um, find something that's going to confirm your intention, you are, you're going to make even more mistakes so that but yeah 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 this is um, i think it's well known fact nowadays but back then people were just unaware of that all right moving on to the next question your favorite po poker book my favorite poker book um must be oh let me take a look uh this one here because yeah i agree on that we wrote it together yeah right and, right and that well, makes it just a favorite uh, because, like, if you work on a book, uh, it's it you have a different relation to it. Um, it doesn't matter if it's good or, or, or bad, but just the the amount of work you put in, like the, the planning, and you, you learn a lot while while you you write the book. It's not just yeah, you know something and you write it down. No, it, it's like actually the other way around. At least for me, like because you have to get in, into into the details and and theory a lot, and then you learn quite a bit uh, uh, when when writing it down for others uh, to to understand it too. So yeah, right. Mastering Pot Limit Oma is my favorite book. <laughs> I, I just realized I gave a wrong answer to this question because <laughs> I, I said something like mathematics of poker or something. But it's also <laughs> really good, you know. I'm uh, I'm, I'm a bad <laughs> yeah, bad salesman, I guess. Anyway. Um, no, but but that's not about sales. I, I just say, like, I agree. I, and, agree, and it, I agree. It's not my favorite book because I believe like it's the best poker book out there. Uh, but it's just like my my relation to it. So that's why it's uh, it's my favorite book. There, there yeah. are many great books out there we could recommend. But yeah, if we talk just about one, for me this would be the one. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I, I mean writing your own book is is really something special. Really special. I can't think of anything else because it's so intense so intense and herbert had his hard time with me when we were writing <laughs> i remember that and i'm really glad i i had uh, i could do it with him all right next question is your the best poker training site ever mm, um uh in mere terms like do, do you mean like in general or for me yeah, it should be for you, but it should be in general. So you, you, you are not not in Gibraltar anymore, right? So you yes. can <laughs> um, you can have an opinion now. <laughs> uh, like for me, like that's even not an opinion. Like the the poker school that changed my life the most and my my approach to poker and I was definitely poker strategy. Um, in my time there, I met so many. Uh, well. The, the the German high stakes community, all all the great players like uh, I met Changelman, um, like that like shaped my my poker career the most. Uh, in terms of like absolute talks, um, I would say it's Deuce is correct too, um, because they they have like this amazing content so early uh, in 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 the, the poker evolution that really uh, really was outstanding. So yeah, yeah, in absolute uh, juice is cracked, and for me, uh, uh, e on absolute terms too, it's PokerStrategy.com. Right. So, like you guys know, Herbert wrote the questions, so he knows most of the questions. But I keep on adding some questions, so he, uh, yeah. he stays excited. I will call who, your bluffs. <laughs> <laughs> who is your best poker buddy? Because you just said that you met so many people at Poker Strategy, and they shaped your career. Is there someone you talked strategy a lot like you got influenced by and you made progress with the most i mean obviously that's gonna be me but <laughs> <laughs> you can be honest this time uh I, I mean when i said like it shaped me the most it was not about so much about theory because there were like many like great advisors um but more about the the approach or the the, the poker lifestyle in general 
like uh, I, I have to name the the German high stakes fixed limit community uh, around like we had choker, schnibbler, sheep, uh, just like being around them, seeing the 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 way they approached the, not only the game but even like real life, and and that had a huge influence on me, um, and obviously. Working in a poker school and poker community, it's like the the, the entire approach uh, that that opens your eyes. So um, yeah, I, I would name name uh, those, uh, even if they never achieved uh, to to teach me fixed limit properly. Uh, yeah, yeah, I actually have to say that many. I mean, the the House of Life was the best fixed limit player. And before him, I think Sheep was one of the best. And people, it's it's really interesting. That should be a, there could be a documentary about it. How they moved up to, the, to those high stakes because um, nobody knew them. And House of Fly is still pretty much mm. unknown, I would say, to most players. He is not the type of jungle man who who was on TV and stuff like that. All right. Next question is about your biggest weakness. Uh, biggest weakness, I already said uh, many times I'm a tilter, but like the, the underlying problem, I believe, is I'm impatient. Um, I don't have patience. Like, uh, and like in, in, a weird, in a weird sense. Uh, so because I, I can grind tournaments, I can wait for my hands. But sometimes like if, you, if your game plan doesn't work or you, you are in a downswing, uh, I'm, I'm too impatient to, to come back. Uh, to to my to my best game, uh, or like I I want it so so hardly that like that that hinders me to to really get back. So uh, like I'm I'm not patient short term. Like uh, I'm I'm at the table. I can fold for three four hours. And that's not the issue. But once like the, the game plan doesn't work or you are in a downswing, I want to go back to no normal and then like. Uh, just this impatience, like to stand it out, to stick to your game plan. Uh, and then I start modifying my game plan. I, I want to, uh, like, uh, like, I take too hasty decisions um, in terms of how I modify my strategy, how quick I want to go back to normal. So that's my biggest weakness, uh, impatience. Now you have a PhD and did, did you try to work on it? And do you even, I mean, it's uh, i think it's pretty interesting for people uh, because so many like go into meditation or self improvement books or self improve yourself like set a timer or whatever and it seems like it's so tough still and you are like the guy who knows everything around it basically and it's still so tough to uh, to you seems like uh, so do you have any strategy did you apply a strategy or very like all right fuck it i am the, the way it is and uh, i just take it um, well, obviously, you have to take who you are uh, in some sense, but uh, there, there are modifications, and I, I, I improved that quite a lot. Like uh, from from when I, I was fifteen, I constantly improved in in that area, um, and and always worked on it. And sometimes it's like you know, it's not about knowing it; it's just uh, everyone knows bankroll management. The tough thing is to do it uh, uh, consistently, and not only. Uh, only knowing and that's the biggest challenge like you have to to learn uh, and work on on the practical application uh, of, of the things you already know because uh, everyone knows i shouldn't tilt uh, i shouldn't have emotions at the poker table i should i shouldn't look up my graph uh, but uh, yeah the the tough thing is doing uh, what you already know like that's the, the the biggest challenge overall why do you think it's so difficult to do it why do most people fail at doing it? So like you said, everybody knows we should eat healthy, we should work out, and people keep buying books, actually, just to be told, yeah, you should eat healthy, and they still don't do it. Why is it so difficult? Because uh, knowing or learning something just in theory, to know it, it's, it's fairly easy. Uh, but doing it, uh, it's like th there are many more things involved than just a thought or an idea, like uh, practice, like there are your, your emotions, like your, your, your social situation or your environment that influences you. There are so many factors uh, that can uh, prevent you from doing the things you know already. Uh, like you have habits, whatever, like you was mm. always a meat eater. You, you enjoy meat. You like meat. You like wine. Uh, so why not? But 
on the other hand, like we know it's not healthy, and you like we need to uh, em embody like the changes we we already know or we would want to do. So uh, the the doing is uh, is has way more aspects and facets than just knowing something. Knowing is easy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And when you just said meat and wine, so yeah, the, the my strategy is. I'm just going to find a study that confirms that it's healthy and then I go for it. Uh, that's my strategy. So yeah, yeah, like human brain can just make it everything. No, just maybe maybe a funny anecdote. So my my philosophy teacher at, at university, he was, uh, he loved coffee and he loved smoking pipes. Like, you know, like, that was cool. yeah, yeah. And, and he, he scattered his entire day around, uh, around that. So coffee and tobacco doesn't go well. So he had a heart attack, really, really brutal heart attack and almost died. He, he woke up of the coma after three, three weeks. The first question he asked the, the, the doctor was, when can I smoke again? And yeah. uh, th this doctor was just laughing at him and said, like, be glad you're alive, but you will never smoke again. So what did my, my, my professor, like, he, he, he looked around until he found a doctor who actually said, okay, like, you, you can smoke again. You will have to do some modifications. And, <laughs> and he went through a lot of doctors until he found one who was a pipe smoker as well and said, okay, you, know, you can smoke, but yeah, take take it calm. And then he was happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's really, really interesting. Seems like maybe... Yeah. So uh, yeah. Before we get too deep into that, it seems like people, human, is just unable to kind of learn things because you are so emotional. There are stories about. Uh, we, I'm gonna add this story, and then we're gonna move on about. There is a tennis player, Marat Zafin, Russian tennis player, who was really, really good. And then he was asked about. We actually had this discussion with Gregic in our uh, podcast when he was asked about training and practice. He was like, "Well, I've got talent. I don't need to practice." And a tennis teacher I had, he was really, really good in Germany. He said, "If Zafin had to train, he would have probably been worse because then he's not motivated. It's it's tough. It's not fun anymore. So life must be fun and stay fun." And moving on to the next question is, how do you? work yourself through downswings um i believe i, I did like a, a poor job in downswings uh throughout my career because it's tough and uh, as as i told you like downswings are, are normal uh and can last for, for quite some time uh but then i i want to go back to normal or uh, I, and th this impatience like just sticking to your game plan because you knew it worked but then you, I, I tried modifying, doing different stuff, uh, and that, that didn't help at all uh, because uh, you, then you, you deviate from your best strategy and then you get confused. Like you, your decisions are, you, you have to think out every decision you make uh, because you don't stick to your game plan, which, which, which you know. And, and just relaxing, uh, like double checking, obviously, if your strategy is profitable, and then just like. Um, Go ahead and, and move forward and don't make too quick a, adjustments to your game um, and just t stick to it because, yeah, uh, downswings are part of the game. Right. There, are, There is actually a strategy I just realized. Some people just, uh, deal, uh, they created a new database in Holder Manager so they don't see the losing <laughs> session anymore. <laughs> That's a good strategy because... Because if you think about poker uh, every day, it's a, today doesn't remember what happened yesterday. And you shouldn't. So you should just, just forget what happened. But it's so tough. You're like still remembering how oh, many binds am I down? I must be seven still to read. You always want your peak. I remember that. Whenever I reach the peak and you have to stay at your peak. Like if you lose just two binds, you're tilted already. You want to move back. All right. We are moving to a next se section of this format for this podcast, which is completes a sentence. We've got 12 sentences. And uh, the first one is, I knew I was a poker player when? When I was earning money for my entire family. All right. The funniest thing that happened to me at a poker table was when? Uh, I need to think. 
Did I write that, that question? Because I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you. I love you. Um, a funny moment. Well, um, in, in Gibraltar, we often went to the casino with the other employees. And we had uh, a colleague, a uh, um, Korean colleague. And he couldn't... N- he couldn't learn how to play poker and it was really funny. Uh, so he, he was like, uh, he was sitting down and then trash talking everyone, like how bad they are, how shit they are. And basically in one night he, he lost, uh, he lost his entire salary for, for of the month uh, and was insulting. He insulted everyone at the table and well, poor guy, but that was like the most hilarious poker sh- session I ever had because every every hand he was trash talking, talking like, you, you, you guys are shit, like you don't know something. Why didn't this work? Like, I'm so unlucky. And he was he lost his entire salary, which, which is poor because he was a nice guy, but he totally got out of control on the poker table. Uh, and yeah. like he was insulting, like really, really hard. And that was the, the, the most like memorable thing and, and even funny, like the things he said, like totally out of context, like insulting your mother because you played ace king, how you played ace king against his <laughs> ace queen and, and that stuff. So that, that was, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, memorable uh, and funny in hindsight. Yeah, poker brings the weirdest stuff out of people. Yeah, people. Uh, and it's interesting that he lost all the money he earned at poker street. <laughs> Oh boy! Oh his boy! Colleagues, by the way, I, I, I don't. Yeah, you didn't win a penny from him, right? You all. I want to see him the next day in the office when he's got to pay for the rent. <laughs> okay, next question. When I'm multi tabling, I play. Um, up to forty tables. <laughs> no, I, I play. I play uh, focused. Uh, I, I made the experience that when I play four to eight tables, I'm, I, I play better poker than when I'm just on one table. So, yeah. Right. I'm You're more impatient. Focused. You're impatient, like yeah. you said. I can click more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, next question is, if poker chips or a computer mouse could talk, mine would say? Uh, given my history, they would say, um, don't hurt me. <laughs> the best poker advice I ever received was to always remember that um, that um, y- you have to count in the the errors the other make uh, in your strategy. Ah, oh, that's a that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I, it reminds me of the bluffs I made when I'm like, I, I mean, there's no way I'm bluffing. And the guy just doesn't care. He's like, well, I got bought a pair. What's up? Let's call. Yeah. <laughs> or no pair. Uh, question number six is, I play my best poker when? When I stick to bankroll management and stop loss limits. <laughs> but you never do, right? Never do. No, no, I, I did. I did quite a lot, but uh, yeah. obviously the, the failures no. uh, stand out uh, yeah, even in yeah. your memory. Because yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, but it but it feels but, really good, like to remember. Actually, I also remember sessions when I quit, when I took the break, and you, I, I felt like a real, a real professional. <laughs> and and uh, it was a, a good feeling, really good feeling. Like, but then the next day you are like, no, it's not, not not working anymore. It's all right. Um, when I play without tracking software, I feel like totally blind. <laughs> um, I, I had this uh, experience many times when I tried to to play from a grind from a laptop or whatever. Like, just um, it it it's really tough, and it was really tough to adjust that you have to pay attention more at, at the table and, and, and remember. So I believe it's a good practice, but uh, for me, it, fe- it felt horrible all the time when I did it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Have you ever played on the iPad? Um, I believe a couple of hands, but never, never too serious. It was always, I played on a phone. Um, all right. How was your experience? Uh, bad, bad. I okay. I, I couldn't. Um, I'm, I really want to have the tables laid out and like yeah, overlapping yeah. tables, all that stuff. Like I, I can't uh, deal with that. Um, 
what uh, which format did you play on a phone um cash game and once a tournament um because my, my i believe my inter went, internet went down and yeah. i had a, a session going so I, I logged in on the phone and played like uh, eight tables on on the phone um and that was hor- <laughs> that was horrible yeah horrible. yeah uh, i'm asking because uh, i remember i play, I, I went to a, uh, to a friend's house for for some some drinking football watching football and there was this quarterly supernova tournament on stars do you remember that that you yes, could yes. enter i never even knew about it and he was like always playing it and i was like all right let's play i played on my iphone and i just made it to the money by folding and all that i, I think i even won like 600 800 i didn't care about the money so much but i played quite a bit on the ipad but like zoom zoom pot limit omaha and i never had a losing session by the way never i find found it very interesting because like you fold and you pay so much attention even at the timing of the players and and you have to play slow because like you can't click you have to enter some amount and then you 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 take a look at the flop i played the best but yeah just one table it didn't uh, it was it was just so boring after a while all right next question is the most embarrassing thing i've done at a poker table is well i I already told you before that was the the one when i started swearing in a 150 people uh, uh, (laughs) video conference uh without knowing me uh uh, in the end like it it was funny but it, it was very embarrassing because uh uh, I was head of education, and that's not how you should behave uh, as <laughs> uh, to your entire freelancer team uh, or, or the German community. So, uh, well, the, everyone laughed uh, uh, about me, uh, and uh, well, well, but that was for sure the most embarrassing moment uh, at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still. I think it's. Um... It's fine at poker strategy because it was a startup and people were young and understood that. But if you're working in at the university, for example, or something that that might cost you the job, even I guess. Next question is my most epic bad beat story is when. Um, well, for sure, uh, it, it was a double, a really hardcore double. It was a brutal. Uh, bad beat and then on top like like a, a sacrificial uh, bad beat so basically i was playing a party poker short six uh, strategy i had pocket sevens um i turned quartz and it was a multi-way pot so and i i got so excited because it, i believe it was the the first moment that i i i hit quartz uh, like with opponents and then i i didn't like my, my brain just switch off i was like oh i i i have quartz quartz and then on the river the other guy was raising me and i didn't even like i was like what what is he doing like i have quartz i clicked the call button and then i saw the money shipping to to his side and i was like what's going on uh and I, I couldn't understand. I wanted to write support immediately and said, "Hey, I, I had quartz. Why did I lose?" The other guy had a straight flush, but like that, okay, you lose with quartz from time to time. But that was a bad beat. But the real bad beat was at that time there was a bad beat jackpot, ah. saying if you lose with quartz, you, you, like the jackpot was hundred fifty thousand. So I, I went from, "Hey, what's going on?" No, I lost the hand, and then no, no, there's the, the bad beat jackpot, and I was like, "Hey, I, I won hundred fifty k." And then I realized that the bad big jackpot, I had pocket sevens, started from pocket eights. If you yeah, did pocket yeah. eights. So, and that destroyed me, really. That was yeah, really oh bad at all. Like, oh, boy. Yeah, I remember that. I remember our party had a bad B jackpot. And there was some full tilt pro, Eric Liu, actually. I think he started um, Playing one the bad beat jackpot and went right away to five ten from the micros when the games were super <laughs> soft and moved to the high sticks. I mean he was so good. He was so good. Really good. Yeah, bad beat jackpot. Boy, pocket sevens. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy, crazy. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um next question is the boost the best poker comeback I've ever made was when? Um 
uh, that was in a tournament tournament actually I, I played many tournaments um like 10 tournaments like uh, simultaneously and then i got bad beats on all of them uh, <laughs> and I, I had one table remaining uh and i i was second in chips or whatever so and then i i got a bad beat there too um uh, i believe i got sucked out with aces against the third in chips i was second and and lost with aces all in preflop against the, thir the third one and uh i was down to whatever like three four big blinds and i was so tilted that i i started going in every hand because i wanted to go to sleep i was tired already uh and then like i won e every hand until i was chip leader again and then i said okay now now i have to stop uh, and play seriously again and uh, i managed to, to get to the final table and i i finished third i believe but yeah that was the uh, uh, like the three big blinds uh, going back like with direct all ins all the time uh, until uh, being chip leader uh, that was the the biggest comeback maybe yeah uh, right uh, if I could create a new poker role it would be I I would create a, a new game um uh, something similar to chess, you know, chess, like it's solved uh, and so on. So, and it's similar to poker in a sense that, well, poker is a, 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 well, a luck factor or whatever, uh, but it, more or less it's solved. Um, and that prevents obviously new players coming in. And in chess, there's something that's called Fisher random chess. Uh, and what it does is it, it shuffles the starting position of the pieces. So you can't... Uh, you can't prepare that much like the the rules basically are the same um but like you 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 have like different uh, starting positions like because all the pieces get shuffled and you don't know before you start the match what's going on and maybe if you could transfer this to poker in a sense to make it like more more randomized that uh solvers wouldn't work or like uh, uh professional players wouldn't have that big of an advantage uh, because uh, even like in, in Fisher Random Chess, like uh, if you are a very good chess player, you have still an edge, but you can't rely on your theory preparation that much because the, the pieces uh, uh, shift. Uh, and I would do something similar for poker uh, as well. Maybe creating a game like you have to enter, but you don't know what format it is. You just set limit and then you... you yeah. Like you have to play fixed limit or pot limit or start or ras. I don't know, uh, but like that would the, be the idea I would follow. Like to randomize it a little bit, to uh, soften a little bit the preparation of, of professional or more experienced players to allow uh, less experienced players to have uh, not an edge, but like to to cut the edge down of the more advanced players. Uh, that's what I would do. Interesting. Sounds interesting. Right. Uh, if my life was a poker hand, it would be? Um, king, queen, check, seven. Uh, like I, I, I have two sons. Uh, one is seven year old. Uh, that's where the seven comes from. And the other one like doesn't fit in the uh, two to ten uh, match. So he's a check. Uh, and queen and king is self-explanatory. Uh, uh, sometimes you feel like seven deuce off or like quads uh in in pot limit omaha but yeah uh if i would wish like my life to become a starting hand uh, it would be king queen seven uh check uh, double suited obviously <laughs> yeah. double suited. so soon it's gonna be king queen jack eight uh yeah next year it will yeah. be uh, yeah, there you go like, uh, we, we approach a better starting hand. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. And, well, and 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 pretty much soon it's gonna be King Queen Jack Ten, and then it's unbeatable. <laughs> All right. Okay, Herbert, that was pretty much very fun. And make sure you guys subscribe and submit questions. Maybe you want us to answer. And if you want to be part of this podcast, also let us know in the comments. And uh, see you next time. Thanks for having me. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Subscribe time. for great content.